everybody, this is Annie and this is Amy and we're visiting some friends today at the Judith A. Bassett Canid Conservation and Education Center. Welcome to Animal Bond Academy. Founded by Amy and Dave Bassett, the Judith A. Bassett Canid Education Conservation Center is dedicated specifically to canids. The center has Ambassador Russian domesticated foxes, Ambassador wolf dogs, primitive dogs, that includes the New Guinea singing dog, and they partner with canine shelters, rescues, and animal assisted therapy organizations. Welcome to the Judith A. Bassett Canid Education Conservation Center. Um, so yeah, we have about it? ten and a half acres here Where'd it go? Um, at the center, which was completely <laughs> undeveloped. Um, so we first started um, having to dig a well and bring power from across the street and build the structure behind you. So the purpose of this center is going to be 100% dedicated to the Judith A. Bassett Canaan Education and Conservation Center from the beginning. And we were very fortunate to get somebody as qualified as Melissa, who not only has a familiarity with working with wild animals from her experience with the um, San Diego Safari Park, but also with dog training. And a lot of our animals are that perfect combination between the two. So where we have um, some of our ambassador animals like the New Guinea singing dog um, are domesticated um, dogs, um, but very primitive. So they have a lot of characteristics of both a domesticated dog and a wild dog. So Lucan is our newest ambassador to the center. Um, newest canid type. <laughs> Lucan is, um, is our wolf ambassador. And as you can see, he's only about five months of age. We actually got him when he was eight weeks of age. Um, so he was just a little puppy when we got him. He was actually part of a captive breeding program from somebody and he actually has an underbite. So they weren't able to use him in that program. So asked if we would be interested and we said, of course. Um, he's like a little mountain goat. That's pretty cute. Um, but as he is not a, a domesticated dog in entirety, um, there's a lot of challenges, obviously, with working with something like him um, to be an ambassador. So both Dave and Melissa work with him um, quite frequently. One of the biggest um, challenges with working with him would be um, wolves tend to have a lot of uh, resource guarding or food aggression. So it's really important that we work with him from day one to be able to mitigate some of the risks that you would have with resource guarding, like taking a glove off of somebody, um, a child. So when we're using him for educational programs, um, <laughs> and so it's part of our whole center or our mission or what makes us a little bit more unique is that we believe that having ambassador animals that people can interact with allows people to have much more of a robust experience with them and therefore through that experience that leads to a better understanding of that species and through that understanding comes a lot more appreciation for them and then down the line that yields cons conservation efforts from them. So we believe that also starting young with children because they are our policy makers of the future. <laughs> um, they will be able to then be their advocates for the future. Um, if you actually bring a dog into the classroom when they're learning how to read, it aids in reading comprehension um, and actually being able to read out loud. So one of our programs that we'd like to develop here is because we have such special canids to use a stepwise process where we actually um, teach kids on the spectrum social skills by having them breed to dogs. And it's and as they graduate from breeding to a golden retriever, then they get to go to a New Guinea singing dog, and then maybe a wolf, and then maybe a Russian domesticated fox is the is the the highlight, the motivator. The other way okay, well this is this is Stumpy. Um, he's a New Guinea singing dog. Now, most people have never heard of a New Guinea singing dog, um, but what they usually have heard of are di Australian dingoes. And New Guinea singing dogs are actually a type of dingo. Um, about five to 6,000 years ago, New Guinea and Australia were one landmass, so they kind of intermingled the populations of, of canids between those two uh, landmasses. 
and um, then the sea levels rose and they separated and the yes the singers evolved separately um, so they're a very very primitive breed they've never really been selectively bred as far as we can tell where most dog species have been only been around for three or four hundred or dog breeds have only been around for three or four hundred years singers as far as anyone know can tell have been around for you know thousands and thousands maybe ten thousand years and the natives of New Guinea knew of them and their stories of them, but they never really, they kind of revered them. They never kept them as pets. And when, when, when Westerners came there, they asked them, well, why didn't you use them as hunting dogs? They said, well, if we had them as hunting dogs, we would never get anything because the dog would immediately get something and then go off with it. And because they're obviously, they're, they're very adept hunters they're the apex predator on New Guinea. Um, and so because they represent this kind of pure lineage of canids that really hasn't been selectively bred, uh, geneticists are very interested in seeing them because they're kind of, we sometimes call them domestication version one because they're the domestication that existed in dogs thousands of years ago, not the domestication that has occurred since then. So a lot of their behaviors and stuff um, are very different than your typical dogs. Um, the, the lineage of these guys actually came out of New Guinea in the 1950s originally um, and that actually started a captive population of New Guinea singing dogs, first at the San Diego Zoo and then from there uh, various other zoos and then they occasionally ended up in private ownership. Um, which is a kind of double-edged sword in that there certainly people are capable of having them in private ownership but if people get them because they think it's cool to own a dingo it's not. Um, they're going to eat your couch. They're not going to be able to be housebroken. All these other things that you expect from domesticated dogs just aren't going to happen with these guys. And shockingly, even though they're, some people consider them the rarest dog in the world, they still end up in rescue. They don't do well in shelters at all. And, um, and you know, there's, they end up actually in the exotic pet trade. And exotic breeders will get two. They don't care if it's brother or sister or whatever, breed them and convince people they're the perfect house pet. And lo and behold, by the time they're, you know, six, six, seven months old, they're already saying, I gotta get rid of this animal because it's climbing trees and doing all these crazy things. And it's already eaten three of my cats and you know, all these sort of things that, because I mean, they're, they're predators and, and they, they have that spirit to them. Uh, even little Stumpy. Um, uh, the center's name, the Judith A. Bassett Canine, uh, or Canid, Education and Conservation Center, and uh, Judith A. Bassett was my mother, um, and she dedicated her life to mostly dogs, but canids in general. Um, she had a reputation as a dog trainer for the one that when dogs were just about to be euthanized, the vet would call her and say, can you see if you can do something with this dog? And it was nine out of ten times she would find a way to get through to the dog and, and, and you know, find out the nature of that bond between people and dogs that's always there, but it's just sometimes it's, it's hidden a bit. So we use that and, to buy the property that um, the center is on and um, named it in her honor. And um, that was a couple, couple years, a couple, three years ago now. And there was nothing here at that point. I mean, it was just literally no, no water, no electricity, just blank land. And so we developed the whole thing, brought water in, did all that, and essentially did that on our own. So we um, just hope to be able to continue on this, you know, legacy of, of exploring what makes canids so unique to humans. There is something unique greater than other animals. Not that other animals aren't great too, but there's just, it's not a coincidence that a canid became man's best friend. There's, there's a, a tinge of similarity between humans and canids in terms of their social structures, in terms of a lot of different things that, um, that make them very unique animals and we can learn a lot from them. And so we just hope to explore that at the center and you know, teach people all over <laughs> how wonderful these are, they are. So we have ten and a half Hi acres, guys. and we actually are just expanded are our doing? perimeter Sleeping? fence here because our plan is to take on um, a lot more rescues. Sleeping so we're actually out? building new enclosures along here. Um, down Who's here is Canine Sleeping. Canyon, so we have enclosures down there for coyotes. Were approved for, so we can Where's rescue she? those. Um, 
obviously wolves and wolf hybrids. Um, there's plenty of those that always need to be rescued. Um, behind you here that you were looking at is our photo shoot area. So we're actually doing some beautification of that as well. But we have to meet obviously different regulations. Um, so we have various types of perimeter fences, airlocks. Nothing new. <laughs> Hair on me is like every day. Yeah. We already have someone knocking at the door. <laughs> so this is, right over here. this is Victor. Um, he's one of our three Russian domesticated foxes that you'll actually meet today. You'll meet three Russian um, domesticated foxes and you'll meet one U.S. captive bred or fur farm fox. Victor's your classic red color that you would find in the red fox. The red foxes are the largest of all the foxes. Come here, Victor. And Victor is the largest of all of our foxes. And then we realized, yes, we smell. We call it our social distancing scent. <laughs> Victor actually loves to be scratched. So he is just gluttonous for people's attention, which as you can see, this is not normal fox behavior. Um, we have rescued foxes that we could not bring in here because of the fact that they would be so scared of you. Um, so we're obviously very conscientious with how our animals feel about the interactions they're having with people. Um, four. So the three Russian foxes you'll meet today were um, born and raised um, at the Institute of Cytology and Genetics in Novosibirsk, Russia, as part of the program uh, for the first year of their life. So their mother raised there. Um, so for the first year of their lives, they barely had any socialization. If you did that same level of socialization, with any wild or captive bred for a farm fox, you wouldn't be able to get near them. Um, but when we got them, they bonded directly with us. Um, they were never food aggressive. So the Russian foxes don't have food aggression or resource guarding issues with us. We can take anything we want out of their mouths. Um, we can still take it out of their mouth without getting fall bit. On her, <laughs> 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 You get an extreme close up. <laughs> she can touch you can touch her. She's a Russian. It's Ishi who's banging on the door. She wants because she knows Melissa has cucumbers. Oh, they're eating cucumbers. So so yeah, Melissa actually has a little potpourri of different treats today. She has cucumbers, um, strawberries in there, as well as blueberries. What else do you have? Regular treats. And strawberries yeah. are gone, I think. Okay, the strawberries, yeah, strawberries are, gone. are gone. The strawberries were the key today. today. And uh, so Maxa is not a color of the red fox you would find in the wild. She's actually a color only found in the Russian fur farms. But um, it was a gift from the Republic of Georgia, a fur farm there, to the Institute of Cytology and Genetics when they first started. It's called a Georgian white. She's a Georgian white with red. It's actually um, homozygous fatal. So it's an interesting mutation that they discovered. Um, but they've kept it within their program there. And so she does, she's not like an arctic fox that turns brown in the summer. It's also disappointing that the fur farming industry is not regulated by APHIS, which is what we are regulated by. They're just regulated by the USDA agriculture. So the standards for how they maintain and keep those animals are actually pretty heinous. So we just did a 30 fur farm rescue recently. So we actually, our rescue coordinator, Victoria, who lives in Tennessee, um, she's our little exotic animal um, spy. So she went out and she, um, there was a fur farmer in Minnesota who actually had contacted her and said they ba he basically had about 30 boxes that he was going to euthanize um, in not a pleasant way. They're never euthanized in a pleasant way on fur farms. Um, but he wasn't even going to pelt them. He was just going to kill them because he just, they had bad pelts. And so we said, well, yeah, let's, let's do something about this. And so we had about two weeks to go out and rescue the 30 foxes, um, with COVID. 
So think about that. So Melissa and I um, left from here. We actually flew. Um, she came from Tennessee and we had found a transport team that was willing to come up and transport them. We had found placement with various nonprofits across the country that were willing to take these guys in. Um, and then we had a transport team that transported them across the country. Um, we did a fundraiser, which is part of our global fundraiser we're doing right now. Um, and we raised the money to actually cover all the transport fees and costs um, for this rescue. Um, and we're still raising money to get the Russian foxes, um, about nine of them, out of uh, Russia and bring them here this year. Okay. So is she, um, she comes from the fur farming world, um, so she is not a domesticated um, fox. Um, she, some people might claim that she's domesticated for fur, but she's not a companion animal. Um, we got her when she was six weeks of age. We worked with her, we trained her, we took her to Comic-Con. We took her all over the place. Um, we really worked with um, resource guarding issues with her, um, food aggression. But out of all the foxes, um, she will still bite us and she bites hard. Um, so that's why we tell people not to um, reach down and touch her. So she is about as good as I think that you can ever get for a U.S. fox, meaning that typically they're very fight or flight and they don't like new environments. Um, they don't like new people because a new person is a new environment. Um, she comes here for the cucumber. She's really comfortable. But when she's done, we let her leave. Um, and so you can also tell everything by ear placement. So you'll see that she tends to have more of the airplane ears than the others. Um, the others are extremely confident and comfortable. She's also much more intense with other outside noises and predators, where the Russians really don't care as much about predators. They lost a lot of those instincts. So if a coyote came up here, they would be wagging their tails saying, hey friend. Um, so we have to be extra careful about their enclosures because if a coyote was to get close to them, Ishi would run and hide, but they wouldn't. So they, they do need a little extra special care. Um, so there's no way we would be able to feel comfortable or to do these encounters if we didn't have the Russian domesticated foxes. I mean, if we only have, we have um, other rescue uh, foxes. Um, Melissa actually um, is working on training with some of them and world of difference. Um, Completely different. Yeah, so, so would you share I had been training the Russian foxes for several months and I had never met them before the first time doing training. And they came in easy breezy like they've known me forever. And so started training them and they were doing great right away. After training the Russian foxes for several months, they decided to see if Libby, one of the American foxes, would be receptive to the training as well. So she comes in completely different than the Russian foxes. She comes shooting in at like, full speed and then bouncing from corner to corner literally screaming at the top of her lungs at me not knowing who i am what i'm doing just stranger danger like who are you what is going on and then so i had a training pouch hanging from my pocket with some chicken bits in there and tossed her a piece of chicken and she's like okay you're kind of interesting but i still don't trust you tossed her another piece of chicken. She saw it was coming from my training pouch and decided she doesn't need me to feed her chicken. She could get it herself. Jumped up and hung herself by her teeth from my training pouch, shaking her whole body around while vocalizing and looking at me like, why am I not getting chicken? <laughs> Did the Russians ever think to do that? No. They sat there kindly and politely waited for their chicken. Libby decided she can get it herself and will do that. And then, so from then on, I didn't wear a training pouch with her with food in it. I always had it in my hands. And even sometimes when she was sitting on a seat like this and I'd have food, she would launch herself at, at me off the seat. Just going, nope, you're not giving me the food fast enough. So definitely a world of difference between the Russian foxes and the American fox. And I've been training her for over a year now, and I still can't um, feed her by hand or wear a training pouch with her. She bit me. So the Russians don't seem to have that inclination to bite. So if you touch Victor's tail, he doesn't like his tail to be touched, first thing he'll do is look at you and give you a dirty look. And then if you persist, 
he'll look at you and be and just get up and leave. Where is she? Well, her first thing she does is just bite. So they don't, the Russians actually have higher levels of serotonin and lower levels of um, cortisol they found. And so that makes sense if you look at how they are. We call them hippie foxes because they literally will come in here and just hang out and chill. Maxa will fall asleep in a stranger's arms just laying there. Um, where Ishi, as I said, is a great representative of a U.S. fox. She will bite. Um, and when she bites, she bites hard. And so we have to respect that difference between what is domestication, what is just taming. You can tame a, a tiger, right? But you, you know, it's not a domesticated animal. Um, and so these guys are definitely very, very different. Um, they, what the Russian did in the program, what they did in the program is quite remarkable. Um, and the interesting part about it is in this whole process that they're geneticists. This is an institution, they're geneticists. No one until us ever thought about why is nobody using them as ambassador animals for their wild and their captive bred counterparts? It's like they are the perfect voice for their wild and their captive bred counterparts. So that is one of our purposes here is to be able to utilize them in ways that no one else can utilize a a red fox because of that fight flight and without compromising them and utilizing our facility to help do behavioral studies to help look at animals and their connection with people and help them to heal people um, in different ways and so um, those are kind of part of my passion so that combined with yeah sure we do rescues we rescue and um, that's a huge part of our center as well. But I think the fact that we have these animals that I believe can help heal people for whatever ails them, um, whether, I mean, we have people who come here that it was, it's on their bucket list to pet a fox and they're crying hysterically as they're, you know, petting a fox and that's amazing and wonderful. But I think that we have the opportunity to even go further than that, but to actually find better ways to actually utilize um, animals like them in a way to help um, develop therapies for people. Well, that's it for us, everybody. Thank you so much from Annie and Amy and the Judith A. Bassett Center and, of course, Victor. We'll see you next time on Animal Bond Academy. Bye. That's so good. Look at him, look at him.